Righteous God, we come before your mercy seat. We enter into the Holy of Holies only by the supreme sacrifice of all time through Jesus Christ, precious atoning blood. We thank you for this great privilege of being called by you. To be called children of God is such a privilege that something that we have never earned of our own. We ask you, Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of the harvest, to send forth more laborers. For the field is ripe, the field is plentiful with harvest. Send forth more laborers for us to call, help be a participant in the great privilege of calling more children of God into eternity. We ask your presence in this meeting today that we glorify the holy righteous name of Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit would guide and direct all things, the hearing and the speaking, that might point to the King of kings and Lord of lords, and who deserves all credit and glory, in whose holy righteous name we pray, amen. I heard a man, a young man called Joshua from Australia, so this is kind of inspired by him as a young man who was doing out street evangelization in Australia, trying to share the gospel. Also for Leah in a church in Georgia who was just building an outreach program and trying to how to effectively be witnessing to people about Jesus Christ. To a gentleman who has a, a prison ministry in Colorado that reaches out to ministers to the prisoners there who are now becoming free, even though they're behind bars, they have never been so free, and those outside in the world are more captive to Satan than they had imagined. And I imagine this message is not being heard in most of the churches, and I'm not bragging, I'm not saying that I'm boasting, but it's been a burden on my heart for the last couple of years. Some of this you may have heard before, but I felt like there, there's something that I needed to share this message with those over the internet and our new business. Good morning, sir. Right nice morning. to have you, friend. Um. Let me tell you this, that if you go outside and knock on a door, yesterday I was giving Bible tracts out and I was giving a person a Bible tract and that how they might know about Jesus Christ. 50% of the doors I knocked on of the people that do not attend church have never been asked, ever. That shocked me. That gives me impetus to go into the community thinking, you know, I'm not going to feel so bad about being rejected because they have never heard someone, would you like to know Jesus? Would you like to know more about our Savior and how He can give you eternal life? William Booth, and you've heard me mention this before, the, he is the founder of the Salvation Army. He was trying to teach evangelism and at the time, the Salvation Army was what they are called, a Salvation Army. They went out into the battlefield where Satan, the god of this world, is ruler and has blinded the minds of those who do not know Jesus Christ. He said, if you go out and I, and I can bring you to hell like Lazarus and the rich man, for one minute in the fires of hell, I could drop my evangelism class and I would give you impetus to go out there and reach the lost. The fact is there are millions out there that have never had anybody ask them to come to church or to share the gospel with them for the first time. I was one of the millions. I was living the great omission. It was an omission, a sin of omission. You know that there's going to be 462,000 people that are going to die today. 300,000 of them will die today. 300 within the hour, all without Christ. And if they die, and they are separated from God forever, and I had a chance to speak to them and share the gospel, 
then I feel like, and the man of the watchtower, their blood is on my hands. Now I know that sounds a little strong, but for, I have never had this until a few years ago when I took him evangelism training. And it showed me that there is a brokenness, a passion that Jesus has for the lost. When he sent the disciples out, he said, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth more laborers into the field. Because people are dying every day, eternally separated from God forever, no second chance. And the fact is only one in 20 born again Christian are sharing their faith on a regular basis and leading more than one person to Christ in their entire life. When I read the, the fact of these facts, it just penetrated my heart and I'm thinking, I was fearing man more than I was fearing God. I had it wrong. I need to fear God. Fear is a form of reverential respect, but it's also a fear of seeing people die without Christ and being and perishing forever. I guarantee that there's not another church today in this town that is going to be preaching on sending out laborers into the harvest field. I'm not bragging, but this church is one of the few, like at the nursing home, how many of you showed up? One of the greatest, highest percentages of the, at the nursing home that I've ever seen. I thank God for you. I told you that. I, I love you all so much for that. That shows me that you're going out into the fields. You're joining me in the harvest. I cannot, I cannot do it on my own. And I do not go alone. When I go yesterday, I prayed that the Holy Spirit would go before me and go with me and give me the words to speak. And you know, I'm not going to convert anybody. Okay? That is not my responsibility. It is their response to His ability. But it is my responsibility to go. When Joshua contacted me a couple of weeks ago, a young man in Australia, he's 15 years old, and he talked about the Joshua generation. I love it. Remember when Joshua picked up the, the mantle from Moses and went in and he became the leader of Israel and he took them across into the Promised Land? It's a younger generation. We are not going to be here forever. I'm almost 60 years old. I will not be here forever. This is a new generation that is going to take up that mantle and have that evangelistic fire for the lost. I'm, I'm so excited that he contacted me. Here is a young man, and you know what? I told him is what his name means. It's a Savior. Jesus saves. That's why I picked that song today, and I usually don't pick songs, and I let other people pick it. Jesus saves. Me, no, but he does need me to tell others about him. Psalm 19, verse 7. What converts the soul? Me and a slick presentation and my handy dandy Bible tracks? No. Jesus saves. The Holy Spirit converts the soul. What converts the soul? The law of God. The Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. That converts the soul. Now, until I can grow little legs on my little Bible track and have them wind them up and walk on their own, he's still going to need me to be the hands and feet of Jesus, okay? He's going to take an imperfect and a weak, a feeble, often frail human being like me, a sinner, a train wreck, to bring the gospel of it. And I think that's where he's more glorified. To use somebody with such a storied background that they would think if you would vote, I'd be the last person I would pick. God would say, exactly! That's the point! Because there's nobody out there that can say, well, I had too much baggage, and I've got too much sin, and I says, then... Let me point you to the text. There is no sin that God cannot forgive. But I have to show them what is the problem. For the first example, I met a lot of people yesterday when I handed out these Bible tracts. <clears throat> they are a good person. 80% of the people, and I kept the count yesterday, eight of out of the 10 people that I ask, if, or, you think you're a pretty good person? Here's the good person test. I would give them a, here's a good person test. They say, yeah, okay, okay, here, take this test. And I ran it through the law. And the law, as it says in Romans 3, 19, verse 20, it stops the mouth. 
The law says to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped. All the world may be guilty before God. I was guilty too. Now when I went out yesterday, I did not go out trying to recruit and, and have members join the church. Okay? That's something that I never mentioned who I was and why I was there except for the fact that I'm trying to keep people from going to hell. Now, unless I tell them the bad news, the good news is worthless. Here's a doctor and you're gonna go, he's gonna send you to the pharmacy and to pick up a prescription. This is what you need. By the way, he forgot to tell you what you need. You're gonna be hesitant to go to the pharmacy. You're not gonna go to the pharmacy to pick something up unless you know you need it. Now, I had blood work. When I gave blood last time, they ran me through a physical. And they, and they guarantee that if you donate blood and you have problems, they're going to send you results to that. Now, if I got a, something back from the Red Cross and they say, buddy, you've got some that glycerides, they're off the charts, and you've got some serious problems, we need you to come in immediately, and, or you need to go see a doctor immediately, they've got my attention. But if they send me to the pharmacy and my, and my doctor calls me and says, you need to go to the pharmacy and pick this up and start taking this and saying, you know, for what? I have no clue. I'm not affected. I'm not going to go rush to the pharmacy and because the copay is going up anyway, by the way. Okay, I'm not going to head to the pharmacy until I know I've seen my x-rays, I've seen the results of my blood works, and I've seen that I'm a sick man and I'm dying. If I don't know that I'm dying with the results that I've seen with my own eyes, forget about it. It's trying to convince, like convince an eight-year-old boy that he needs a bath without showing him the mirror. And the law of God is the mirror, and it shows us our fault. It shows us that we are sick, incurably sick and dying, and we are separated from God. In the state we are at, we cannot be reconciled because God is holy. The only time in the Bible it mentions holiness three times is God holy, holy, holy. Me, I am a man of unclean lips. I cannot approach the throne of God. People have said to me, I want to see God. I want to see proof of God. Buddy, let me tell you, if you saw God, you would perish. No man can see God and live unless you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to you. No man can stand before God. I can't stand before God. I needed Jesus Christ and the blood of the Lamb to be accounted my righteousness, when God the Father looks at me, He now sees the righteousness of Christ. So the cross, if I went out and preached the cross to people without telling them that they are sick and they're dying, they're going to hell, it's going to be foolishness. Didn't Paul say the cross is foolishness? It's stupid. One guy that I talked to at work said, it's stupid. That is stupid and it is stupid to them because they don't know that they've broken a holy law of God. We've all broken the law. I am a liar. I am a sinner. I have been murdering at heart. This is probably why when Jesus sent the disciples out, two by two, he said in Matthew 9, 37 and 38, I'm going to paraphrase here, Matthew 9, 37 38. What did he tell the disciples? Did he say, pray for the lost, Okay, pray that we might raise funds. Pray to bring people into our church. Pray to build new activities for a new church home. For no, he said, pray to the Lord of the harvest. The harvest is plentiful. That's what Jesus said. Plenteous means it's an abundant harvest out there. I've gone through two-thirds of the way through Mulvane, and I'm not quite through there yet. I've still got to go across K-15, and I'm going to go across, I'm going to be careful crossing the highway to you, okay? Pray for me there. <laughs> because it's, you know, I get on a mission, and sometimes I get focused, and I don't pay attention a lot to, you know, cars in the street. <laughs> Jesus said there, the labor is plenteous. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. So Jesus didn't say, pray for me, pray for them, pray for yourself, pray for safety, pray for fundraising, pray for new members. He said, pray for laborers. So if a person drives through a school zone 
and they're driving at 60 miles per hour and they don't know that there's a speed limit there that says what is it 20 miles per hour yeah, 20. and there's no speed limit sign they're gonna go zipping through there but unless they see the speed limit sign and they have broken the law and somebody paid their fine because they went through at 60 miles per hour they're not gonna care they're gonna think it's stupid that why are you pulling me over for what the officer says this is a school zone they could have killed children that's a serious crime you could have went to jail involuntary manslaughter is a serious charge and you're gonna to go to prison and in some states you're gonna get the death penalty okay but the way it is now people out there in this community are already under the death penalty but I need to show them somebody has paid their fine and stepped up and died to pay your fine for a debt that he didn't owe for a debt we couldn't pay. It, it, does that make sense to you? Yeah. Is that Now if you if you see like Tim Tebow and I have nothing against Tim Tebow, he's a great example and he's a, a wonderful Christian man and he's a good role model. They like to fly that John 3:16 is a wonderful verse. And they say, you know, yes, Jesus loves us. God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomever should believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But in John 3, 17, and in John 3, 18, they forgot that those go together. That he who does not believe is already condemned. You cannot have the life and the eternal life is a nice deal. But unless you talk about the condemnation, they're going to say, well, Jesus is going to enhance my life. He's going to give me peace and happiness. He's going to give me joy and love. God never promised that. Sorry, Joel Olstein. God does not have a miracle in your mouth. You have unclean lips. We're all sinners. There is no health and wealth and prosperity gospel. Now, people get mad at me when I, when I talk about other. I'm not talking about other religions. I'm talking about false gospels that need to be exposed that the book that he wrote every day is a Friday. Right, we all live for a weekend. That's one of his best sellers. That's a real good, feel good. I'm happy, we're all happy. You know, what has the guy been teaching? It's a false gospel. It's a false gospel. If you teach a gospel that only talks about that you have peace, joy, love, happiness, fulfillment, without telling them about the bad news that if they die separated from Christ and they go out and reach others, it's worthless. Happiness, Jesus never promised happiness. Jesus never stood on the freak corner and said, I love you. It was about you hypocrites, you broad vipers. To the religious, he condemned them. He said it's like whitewashing your fence. It's going to be good for about a year. It looks good, but on the inside, it's rotten. I was rotten. I was the same way. And I stand here no better than anybody here today. So that's not a drawing card. It's real. That's what they use it is to fill in their pews and to fill up the church membership and to bring people into this prosperity. This weekend again, the Inspiration Network was talking about this thousand dollar seed that guy was, and I watched him last night. I know there's God has spoke to me. There's a thousand people out there that today are going to have their their mortgages paid and their bills going to be paid and their and their business is going to prosper if they let go of that seed of faith but they spell seed of faith with a dollar mark s with a dollar mark god spoke to them it's the god of this world yeah not the god of abraham isaac and jacob you know i know i get upset but when i see false gospels like that taking money from the widows and promising seeds of faith they make god to be a quid pro quo I'll do this and you do that for me. Oh. And I tell you, I, it makes me angry. Me too. I, that's a human gospel. It is. it is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no fleeing from the wrath to come. If they don't know that there is wrath to come, they will never flee. In fact, if they, if they don't look at the law of God, they're not even going to know what sin is. James said the sin is like a mirror. I look in the mirror, and the mirror doesn't affect me. It doesn't fix me. 
I have to comb my hair. I look in the morning, Monday morning, I says, oh, oh God, I'm in, I'm in trouble. I need to comb my hair. <laughs> I'm supposed to go to work looking like this. The law of God exposes my faults and my sins. And I'm thinking, I'm in dire straits. The mirror is not going to fix it. It's going to take something else. It's going to show me where I'm, I'm, it's going to show me my sin and my faults. It will not fix it because nobody can keep the law. I can't keep the law. I think that's why they call uh, Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron the way of the master. It is hell's best kept secret. It's one of the best kept secrets. And I think Satan wants to keep it a secret. That's why you very rarely see TV evangelists talk about the cross and Calvary and the blood of the Lamb and He died for you and you are going to go to hell without Jesus Christ being separated for eternity. Now eternity, try to explain that to my children. It's a very, very, very long time. Very, really, really long time. It's like never ending, never, ever ending. When does it end? It doesn't end. It just goes on and on and on. It's like you're grounded until you're dead. Okay. It's just hard to explain a concept of eternity to somebody. It's like, it's like if you don't tell them, you're going to go out there. My, my brother almost drowned when he was young at Lake Afton out here well, west of Wichita. He had a cramp in his toe of all places. And is that enough to cause you to drown? It is. The same thing with sin is enough to cause you to die. One sin, you stumble on one, you're guilty of all of it. So here he is. I'm trying to save him. If he's not drowning and he doesn't know he's drowning, we're both going to drown, okay? He's going to think, get out of here. What are you doing? Now, if he knows he's drowning and I try to rescue him, he's going to cooperate. He's going to want a rescuer. Jesus is the rescuer. And the lifesaver is the very precious blood of God. How about that? God, creator, died, bled, his blood, a God dying for a, a, his creation. I just, I just can't, I can't understand that. You remember the rich young man, and he came in, in Luke 10, 25 through 30. In Luke 10, 25 through 30. He came up there and he said, you know, Master, what do I do to have eternal life? That's a good question. Okay. That's a really great... I wished I had a window like that. I wished I was... When I was yesterday walking out of the community, handing out Bible tracts or talking to... I went to every college student. There was probably like 30 cars at the college. And I stuck, I stuck these Bible tracts in here, the good person test, in that, each one of them. Now, I stuck it in between... I found a new place. In between the doors, you know where you shut your door? You know, a lot of times on the windshield, they're going to, you know, they're going to drive off without it or they're going to, you know, oh, it's annoying. But here, I can stick it in between the door and the frame, the, the passenger, and the uh, driver's side door. It's right there. They've got to actually reach it and open up their door and it's going to go like this. So it, I found a new way to place that in. So it's going to give them a, a good person test. When they're going to read that, they're going to think, you know, most of the students that I've talked to, they said that they're pretty good people. They, and some of them even said that they are Christian. And when you're running through the good person test, do you think you're a good person? Yeah, I think I'm a good person. Have you ever told a lie? Yeah, I guess I have told a lie before, you know. What does that make you? Like most people. They'll say, well, yeah, I know it makes you like most people, but what does that make you more specifically? If I told a lie, what would you call me? A liar. A liar. Okay, so he says, okay, I'm a liar. Now, have you ever looked at a man or a woman with lust, and depending on who I'm talking to, I, if I was talking to a woman, I probably wouldn't use that. Because I don't want to ask a woman, have you ever looked at a man with lust, and here I am a man, and here's a woman. So I use another sin. But most of these guys that I, I use are men. I say, have you ever looked at a woman with lust in your heart? I said, yeah. Well, Jesus said, if you look at a man or a woman with lust, depending on who you're talking to, and sometimes it could be a man too, you know, depending on this day and age. Okay. With lust in your heart, depending on your persuasion, then you've committed adultery in your heart. That's what Jesus is telling in, in the young man. You think you're a good person? Wait a second. And then have you ever stolen anything? Yes, most people have to agree. Well, if they disagree, well, I said, okay, you just told me you're a liar. Am I supposed to believe? Have you ever looked at somebody and hated them? A lot of people were going to agree, then you've committed murder in your heart. 
So now you've admitted you're a lying, thieving, adultering, murderer at heart. Based upon that, when you sit at the great white throne judgment and you are going to be innocent or guilty, what would you think? Are you going to heaven or hell? And they're going to say, most people are going to say, still going to waffle on that. They're going to say, I think I'm going to go to heaven because God is a good God and He's a God of love and He's got a peace and joy and happiness. And I said, hold it. Try that in a court of law. I faced a judge, a judge that was a family friend of mine, and he thought, I, you're a pretty good guy. Yeah, I like your family. You're still guilty. Sorry. It didn't help me. I went to jail. It didn't help me. Because he is a good judge, he's going to send you, he's going to send you right to so until they get convicted that they are going to hell without Jesus Christ paying the fine, I keep giving them the law. I keep giving them, showing them they're not a perfect person. They are not a good enough. Nobody, what does it say about good works? No. You know the original, it's like filthy rags. You know what the original meaning of the filthy rags? I did more research on this. I found it was the rags that were from lepers. There was the original rags that were wrapped around the lepers. Talk and leprosy is a symbolism of sin. So would you want to present here? Here's my good word. I'm a good person. Here's lepers, filthy rags, God. In, in Revelation 20, verse 12, 2012, huh? That's the year today, 2012. Present that before God the Father in, or the Jesus Christ. At, at the great white throne judgment. See if that's going to help you. Not. Okay. So here was Jesus was saying. He was feeding them the law. This young rich man. Well I've kept the command. I've done this. I've obeyed my. I've done all these commandments. Jesus kept giving him. Until he realized. Okay. You're a young rich ruler. Why don't you give your money to the, to the poor? Uh oh. Uh oh. That got him. Okay. And James says, if you've broken one law, you've broken them all. The young rich ruler was proud. And God kept, Jesus is God. He kept giving him the law until he finally broke it. The man never did come to faith. It doesn't appear that he ever did. And I believe that that young rich ruler may have been the ruler that died that was for Lazarus, that mentioned in Lazarus. Jesus sometimes gives stories that are parables, sometimes they're stories. The Lazarus and the rich man, Lazarus went to hell. I do not believe that that was a parable. I believe that was a true story. It would not surprise me that that very young ritual that came to him and the same one that built more barns, that he could have more stuff, Look at me, I'm rich, I need bigger barns. He tore down his old barn and built bigger ones. And God said, you fool! Tonight your very soul is demanded of you. It would not surprise me that that is the same young rich man that, was, that he saw Lazarus. And when Lazarus was in hell, and not in hell, but he saw the, the rich ruler in hell, that he could not reach that chasm. He could not go from there to there. It's, it's an unbridgeable gap. You, I cannot, that gap is too far for me to come back and forth. I can't. So really, the, the, the law is kind of a, a schoolmaster. My wife is a teacher, and she's teaching them ABCs. And so the law is kind of like, it teaches us what sin is. Sin is the, is the breaking of law. So after, after I ran the guy through, a couple of guys through that, I had to call it, and these are young college students. If you're a young college student, it kind of reminds me of the young rich man. They feel like they've got their whole future ahead of them. And they're going to college, and they're doing okay. They're pretty fine. They don't have any problems. They've got a bright future. Then I hope they do. But that good person test runs them through that and shows them that they are in need of a savior. Otherwise, they feel like they're doing pretty good, like the young ritual. He felt like he had been pretty well made. He had no problems. But until you run up to the Ten Commandments, now and it said, you know, Romans said that really they know in their minds. You can run through Romans two fifteen says, you know, they are without excuse. You know, they have the conscience. 
knowledge of sin, conscience with knowledge. And so I kind of ran him through that, and it's funny because my no my notes I'm already halfway through my notes and I didn't even use them. I, I kind of because it's 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 all up here because I've used that so often that it's become incorporated into my mind. So it's kind of nice to not be able to be tied to notes, but I have to go catch up because so what he is what Jesus did was and it's the same method that we need to use is is ninety percent law, ten percent grace. If you give them the law. They will not accept grace. Now, if you give them grace first, they'll see no need for the law. Okay, it is like you're saying you're trying to diagnose them with the disease without showing them the lab results. It's, it's kind of the same thing. They're, ne they're never going to embrace a cure if they don't know they're sick. It, it's, <laughs> I hate flying. Okay, I fly, what, about seven, eight years ago when I worked for Head Start, I went all over the, the nation. And I was in an airplane one time. And this plane was running out of fuel and they couldn't land because they didn't want to land with a lot of fuel because it was, they had wind shear and there were thunderstorms. And believe me, I'm praying. Oh God, I've been praying. I'm a prayer warrior all of a sudden. Okay, I'm thinking, you know, we could all die up here. And you could tell by the passengers, they were scared, they were very fearful. And we're circling Mid-Continent Airport, and the plane is kind of, wham, I mean, you know, you couldn't have any, they couldn't hand drinks out, because the drink would come up and out and over and into the next guy's lap, you know. <laughs> oh, man, they try, I've been on a few before oh, that's wow. happened. You know, the drink, and I've actually seen it happen. We landed in Minneapolis Airport, which is a real small runway, and they have to shut her down real fast. And the drink, and they had a bump, and the guy's drinking, I watched this, the, the drink, the water came out of his drink, and went, <laughs> Right into the next guy's lap. I mean, for, it's shape and shaping everything. Okay. But until you realize, if you know you're on a plane and, and you know the thing's going to crash and you don't have a parachute, but you don't know it's going to crash, you don't need a parachute. If you know that, that plane eventually, all 100% of humans die, okay? One out of every one, I've counted. It's an amazing stat. If they don't know the plane is going to crash, they don't need a parachute. They could care less about a parachute. But if you know there is a crash coming and they crash or the fires of hell, Jesus is the parachute. The lifesaver is Jesus Christ. Now I'm not trying to give them not really fearful converts, but a tearful convert. If, the, if that makes sense. So the law converts, the Holy Spirit does the calling, and it and actually, I would say to put it this way, the Father draws them, Jesus saves them, and the Holy Spirit convicts them. So our salvation is, a, is an image of all three. So what that does to me, it says, it's not up to me. It's up to me to be a laborer and to share the gospel and to go out into the community and not care if I get rejected. And I got some pretty good rejection. I almost got one of my foot caught in the door one time. I mean, it just slammed. And then one guy was, looked like he was going to introduce me to his pit bull. But you know what? And I've been chased by dogs. I've been chased by even cats. You know, I told oh, you about I, I, cats. Even, I didn't know cats would chase. But, uh, and then, and so, and I've actually seen skunks. I, I've seen people that, are very hostile toward it and says, I don't need that. And it makes me feel, it doesn't make me feel bad because I'm, they're rejecting the message. They're not rejecting me, they're, they're rejecting the message. So, just keep in mind, when you witness to somebody and tell them that they are going to stand before a holy God someday and they are going to be found either guilty or innocent, Jesus is an advocate. An advocate means an attorney. This is better than Bradley Apostolic. Okay, this guy is real legitimate. This is not like calling your attorney. And, and this, he will stand in the courtroom for you. And if you were saved, God is going to ask you someday, why should I let you into heaven? You would say, Jesus. 
you don't have to let me in heaven because of what I've done. It's because of what he has done for Praise me. God. Because Jesus died for me. He paid a fine that I could. He paid a debt that I could not pay for a, for a debt that I owed that I could not afford to pay. I had no ability to pay it. Praise God. And Jesus paid a debt that he didn't owe for something that I couldn't pay. Praise God. And so, next time you ask somebody if, if, you, if you think you're going to go to heaven or if you think you're a good person, run them through the law and see if they are in need of a Savior and point them to the law. The law converts the heart. I don't. The Holy Spirit will reveal who Jesus is and it's not my responsibility. It takes it on. At times I put that a little bit too much on my shoulders. To be honest, I, I'm putting too much weight on my shoulders. But the law of God and the Holy Spirit does the converting, but he, he still needs laborers and that's why I want to implore you to go into the field and to don't worry about being rejected or spurned or embarrassed or ridiculed or called stupid like the one guy or called he said it's really stupid i feel bad for them because i know where their eternal destiny is going and so i'm not going to worry about making friends and winning friends and influence pink people but about being rejected and scorn and in a few cases being the gospel of glory and saving somebody from the fires of hell to reveal a savior so we can glorify Jesus the more people that we bring to Christ in faith and saving faith is to trust and believe in Jesus and not to have him come into my heart but to place their faith and trust in the advocate who can pay who has paid your fine before a holy righteous God that makes me feel good, even if I can give that message to one person. I planted seeds yesterday. It may take a long time. I may never see the harvest. But unless I plant the seed, no harvest will come. So pray with me for more harvest workers, for more laborers to come into the field to seek those that are dying without Christ to be eternally separated from God forever. Would you pray to the Lord of the harvest with me? Righteous God, we know that there is a burden on your heart. You desire none to perish. We know that you want us to seek those that are lost. To leave the 99 sheep to seek the one. As the widow swept the house to find the one lost coin and rejoiced over her one coin, so you rejoice in heaven over one sinner coming to faith and to be saved from the fires of hell. You desire none to perish, and so neither should we, O oh Lord God. Put that fire for the lost into our hearts to seek those with abandonment, that we know that the responsibility is yours to call and save, but it is our responsibility to go. It is their response to your ability, but still our responsibility to share our faith and tell others that they will die eternally separated from you, God, without a Savior and appoint Him to their need to be able to approach a holy, holy, holy God such as you. Pray for more laborers, O oh God. In Jesus' precious, righteous name, and for his name's sake, I pray. Amen.